All right, I heard you. I was a bit surprised by how well received the what if centered around Kushina's survival was. Not only was it viewed by a lot of people, but those people commented how awesome they thought it was, and many of them actually began asking for a second part. Honestly, the way I ended that what if did leave quite a bit of room for further detail. And so, because I love y'all so much, I'ma bring you the second part. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Also, we just released some brand new merch. If you'd like to show your support for the channel even further while at the same time repping stylish clothing, be sure to check that out as well. The store is linked below. YouTube has been unsubscribing users from channels lately. So if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Amagi. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. For starters, I suppose I should inform you of the obvious in case you weren't paying attention or randomly chose this video, but this is actually a second part, a sequel to another video as I said earlier. That being said, your experience with this video might be diminished if you don't see the other part first. I mean, I'm not one to judge if you'd like to see them out of order, but just in case you haven't seen part 1 and would like to, here's a link to that previous video. Now for those of you ready for the story, let's get into it. When we last saw Kushina, she had taken it upon herself to learn why the Uchiha were massacred. To that end, she recruits the help of Kakashi who gives her all the information she needs to accomplish this. However, as she claims the proof for herself, she returns to her home only to find it ransacked and empty. Members of Root have taken Sasuke and Naruto and held them hostage. However, Itachi shows up as the deal turns sour and rescues both Kushina, Naruto, and his little brother Sasuke. Using the power of the Izanami, they stop Danzo from continuing to use Izanagi and kill him while he's under Genjutsu. So what happens next? Well, I did give some hints to it in the last video. Kushina leaks it. She has it published in every paper, talked about by every news organization. It spreads like wildfire. And with the wife of the fourth Hokage, they know that her words carry weight. She would not lie about something like this. And even if her words weren't as trustworthy as the people believed, she carried enough proof to sway them. This is a worst case scenario for Hiruzen and the council. All through the day, the people gather at the gates of the Hokage's residence and demonstrate. At night, they riot in the streets, the Anbu being called upon to keep them out. Hiruzen sits in his chair by the window, watching this happen. He realizes the simple fact that perhaps Tobirama chose wrong when he chose him to be third Hokage. He was the only Hokage in history to ever be driven out by the people he served, and he was about to be driven out again. As he sat there and watched, a voice came from behind. I know you didn't mean to. Hiruzen didn't even turn around. Whether I meant to do it or not is irrelevant. I was incapable of protecting those within my village. I have failed them, Kushina. She would then step out of the shadows. She couldn't disagree with Hiruzen, but to a point she respected the man. She respected him like a great uncle. She knew Hiruzen's heart. He wasn't a bad man, nor was he evil. He was just, for lack of a better term, weak. Not physically, but emotionally, spiritually. Kushina had been good friends with Biwako before her death on the day Naruto was born. She had seen how it had affected Hiruzen. He was strong for those nearby, but only she saw it. Hiruzen was just a man. A smart man, but a man whose heart and temperament could not allow him to draw the ire of anyone. That mentality sadly was something that wasn't fit for Akage. Sometimes you had to make a tough choice, regardless of how it made you feel. Hiruzen just couldn't do that. His sorrow from the Shinobi World War, the bloodshed, Seeing the faces of those who knew that their mother or father or wife or husband or sibling would never be coming home broke him. He had to push the armistice to end the war. He was too busy focusing on stopping the loss of life that he did not recognize that he had invalidated the sacrifices of all those who died on the field of battle, and that led to his first downfall. Then, after he resumed the position after the death of Minato, it was his inability to stand against Danzo that caused the Uchiha to perish. His failure to put down Orochimaru when he had the chance was what led to the formation of Otogakure, a fringe terrorist state that had only existed because Hiruzen was weak. The fact Orochimaru's experimentation had gotten so far was another mistake of Hiruzen's who had failed to stop it when he realized just how many people were dying. Hiruzen was not a bad man, he was just a bad leader. That Kushina could accept. Despite everything, despite the failures and screw-ups on a massive scale that he was guilty of, the complete and utter negligence on his part as Kage, she still respected the man and cared for him. But as it stood, it was time for him to step down. Your time has come. You know that, right? 
she asked him gently from across the table. He would nod. The time has come and long gone. It should be Minato running this village right now. Perhaps if I had been stronger, he still would be here. She shook her head. Don't blame yourself for that, Hiruzen. That one wasn't you. It was never you. He looked down. I'm not so sure. He turned around to face her. He took his kasa that bore the kanji for fire off and set it on his table. It's time for us to leave this to the next generation. Just as Lord Hashirama and Lord Tobirama left the future to me, I must pass it forward for the good of the village. If the only thing I've ever done as Hokage is making the decision to stop being Hokage, then I'll accept that. She had a bit of a sorrowful look on her face as he said that. Hiruzen would then stand and leave the office. Passing into the darkness, he left behind the role of Hokage for good. The day after, news was spreading across the village that Hiruzen had stepped down from his position as Hokage. He and the other elders had also retired from their positions of leadership and council for fear of revolt. The people were pleased. Some continued to seek justice, but the head of the Anbu and the senior Jonin would take control of the village until such a time as a new leader could be decided. Kushina, the crowds cried out. Kushina will lead us. She had mused upon her childhood, her dreams of becoming Hokage, the first woman Hokage in the history of the village hidden in the leaves. But by this time, her interest in the position had waned considerably. She had seen the work Akage must do, and she didn't know if she could handle that right now. Not now that she was a mother raising two children on her own. But the crowd called out for her all the more. Kakashi, one of the trusted members of the Anbu who was helping run the village, would come to Kashina at Ichiraku, as was their usual meeting spot. There, he would talk to her. What you did was incredible. You single-handedly turned the whole village on its head. It is to be as expected from the wife of Lord Forth, though. Kushina, between slurps of noodles, would deny this, stating that she could have done nothing without Kakashi and his guidance. Kakashi would remain modest, telling her that he merely provided her with the information she should already know. As time continued, Kakashi would turn to her. You should consider becoming Hokage, he would tell her. She would look at him out of the corner of her eye with a half-sarcastic smirk. You know I can't do that. I'm raising two children now. I don't have time to balance. Kakashi would nod and continue. The village is going through upheaval. Everything is changing. With the genocide of the Uchiha as well as the Hyuga affair, the greatest clans of the Leaf are faltering. And even some of the other clans are whispering worries that Konoha can no longer protect them, or worse, could be a threat to them. The Nara clan and the Yamanaka clan are two of our strongest outside of the Uchiha and Hyuga, and they're considering splitting off. The people are scared of what the future will bring. What they need right now is something from the past, something they can trust. What they need right now, for better or worse, is a mother's touch. She thinks about this carefully. Kakashi then states that the position will come with people who can watch her children when she can't, and that does sweeten the deal quite a bit. After all, Mama needs some alone time. So she decides that she would like to accept the nomination by the people of Konoha and begins the process. She would meet with the fire daimyo about accepting the position where he and his advisors would go over her track record, her background, achievements, and anything that could stand out as troublesome for her. Thankfully, she is cleared and the daimyo gives the okay. Kushina then returns to Konoha where she takes the position officially and is ceremoniously inaugurated as the fifth Hokage of the Hidden Leaf Village. The first thing she does is surround herself with an administration she knows she can trust. The first person on the list is Kakashi Harake, who is honored to take this position on her council. Unofficially, she keeps Hiruzen around. Despite the fact that he was incapable of making world-altering decisions, his input on the day-to-day -day monotony of the job, decorum, and a few other attributes where she could admit he excelled as a Kage. He wasn't given an official position and was more treated as a friend of the family. However, she was sure to delegate resources in such a way that he was paid as if he were a full member of staff. She still cared about Hiruzen, and knew that with the death of Biwako, he had nothing else in his life. She wanted to at least give him purpose, and make him feel like he was aiding Konoha in a capacity that fit his mentality, and he did. In fact, this turn of events made Hiruzen truly happy. He was at first a little iffy about it, not thinking himself worthy of holding even an unofficial position within the government of the village. But with some convincing, he agreed and found it to be even more fulfilling than being a Kage. Along with this, his great knowledge of jutsu was indispensable and was often used to help train Naruto and Sasuke as they grew, forming them into true elite members of the academy whose sheer ability and potential surpassed even Itachi's at that age. However, not everything was so happy and cheerful. After the Hyuga affair, the downfall of the Uchiha, and the revolt that ended Hiruzen's rule, tensions began to rise within all of the great clans of Konoha. The Hyuga were ever steadfast with the village, though the affair indeed left some scars. 
The Nara and Yamanaka clans were beginning to show disdain for the village, which meant several visits were required by Kushina to ensure them that everything was safe. In her conversations with the clan heads, she did her best to remain respectful towards the clan head, and to remain respectful when speaking of Hiruzen, knowing that the Sarutobi clans were very close to the clans as symbolized by the earrings worn by each generational member of the Ino Shikacho trio. She still managed to distant current Konoha from the former Konoha, all while somehow also managing to make it seem like it was the same. Her goal was to put them at ease, and show them that she would do her best to become the new Minato. The Yamanaka clan would be the first to trust her due to the various mind techniques which allowed them to see into her mind, find her intentions, and realize what was or wasn't the truth. The Nara clan was a little less forthcoming, though they softened up a little after witnessing the Yamanaka clan so willingly join up with her. They would agree to remain within the village as well, but only if she agreed to learn how to play Shogi from Shikaku Nara, head of the clan. For Kushina, this was a very odd request, but she went along with it. For a time, they began to go over the pieces, their function, how they're generally placed, the limitations of each piece, and the strengths they can bring each other. Once Kushina learns this, as well as the starting positions, Shikaku begins going over various strategies and maneuvers. But he reminds her that no matter the strategy you choose, you must always ensure that the king is protected. And to do so, sometimes you must make moves that appear to take you in the wrong direction some moves that sacrifice other pieces. No matter what happens, you must protect your king. You can promote pieces, capture others, and turn them to your side, but all these pieces will only ever serve two main roles, to protect their king and capture the other king. Kushina listens to him speak. Then, Shikaku suddenly seems to change the subject and asks what Kushina thinks about the village, about Hiruzen, and most importantly, about the decision to eradicate the Uchiha. Kushina states that she loves her village and has many times sacrificed for it and is willing to continue sacrificing for it. Shikaku is pleased with this answer and prods her onto Hiruzen. She states that Hiruzen was a great man, but that he was misguided and particularly weak when it came to certain decisions, and the destruction of the Uchiha was detestable. Shikaku would nod in understanding. He'd continue to speak. Hiruzen was a great man, but he was terrible at shogi. Regardless, his determination to keep Konoha going was what drove me to respect him. Kushina listens as Shikaku begins to elaborate. Look down before you, Kushina. What do you see? She would look down. A shogi board. He would smile. I see the shinobi world. Kushina was confused for a moment. Shikaku began to explain. Your king. Do you know what that is? Kushina would shrug. It's definitely not me. Shikaku would nod. You're damn right it's not. And if you had claimed it to be you, I would have resigned the Nara clan from being a part of Konoha right then and there. But you are showing a humble capacity to learn, and so I shall explain. He lifted the king up. This piece represents Konoha as a whole. And the many clans and organizations within Konoha are these. The pawns, lances, knights, bishop. These each are the clans and other shinobi. Each one has strengths and weaknesses, but each one is balanced by the other, and their sole purpose is to protect the king and capture the enemy. Those two concepts are not mutually exclusive either. Sometimes strength and warfare are used to protect one's nation by defeating the other that threatens it. Men of peace prepare for war. The balance between concepts remains. Hiruzen and I never once played a game of shogi together, not with this board anyway. He and I played shogi with the other shinobi villages. That game was called the Great Ninja War. That was how I know that he was not a fantastic shogi player because I saw the many unnecessary moves he made. The most detestable of all was forfeiting the game when we were going to win, but at the same time, I respect that decision. Do you know why? Kushina was speechless and merely shrugged. Shikaku continued, because Hiruzen was attempting to protect the king. The king cannot be taken if the game is over. In that way, I also praised his response to the Hyuga affair. He was willing to sacrifice someone to maintain peace. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of things at stake in situations like this, which is why wars and politics have infinitely more dimensions than Shogi, but the basic premise is the same. He knew our power, and better still, the other nations knew our power. When war was threatened, he had nothing to gain by fighting, especially after we had just signed the armistice with Iwa. The peace we had was paid for in blood. He hoped to keep it, and in doing so, he sacrificed a pawn to protect the king. A pawn that could not be used further against the king should the game continue. He showed what many considered disloyalty to the Hyuga, but his sacrificing of Hizashi was what stopped so many others from dying in a meaningless conflict, and the Hyuga knew that. But let me ask you this. Let's say that a piece on the board is taken and reintroduced to the game as your enemy's piece. What do you do then? Kushina thought for a moment. You remove it from the game. Shikaku would nod. 
This piece that I took and am now using against you, they're the Uchiha. She almost flipped the game board right then and there. She stood. How can you say this? Are you saying that what happened to the Uchiha was the right thing to do? Shikaku sat there and waited for her to calm before speaking. Not exactly. There were other, better ways to handle it. We could have easily recaptured the piece, and that's something that's troubled my clan ever since the event transpired. But at the same time, removing them from the game was not altogether off the table. The Uchiha were planning an uprising. Danzo's actions were the actions of a man protecting the king. You should know that the age we live in is one of deterrence. One sword keeps another in its sheath. The Uchiha were strong, but they did not make up the entirety of Konoha's power. If they had succeeded in their coup, it would have weakened the village to a point of a complete loss of balance on all boards, and would have spiraled into war. What happened to the Uchiha should have been the last resort, but at the same time, never forget that it was still something we could have easily resorted to. I'm upset because a piece was wasted and worry that our clan could be easily wasted as well. Not that I hold a grudge for the disposal of a treasonous clan. Kushina's blood was boiling, but she was maintaining herself for many reasons. The first was because she didn't want to destroy any hope of bringing the Nara clan back into the fold but the second was because Shikaku was making a lot of sense, and she hated it. Shikaku would sit. What I'm trying to do here, Lord Fifth, is teach you, remind you of the responsibility before you. If any clan ever becomes a threat to you, balance the choice as well, weigh the risks and rewards, but never hesitate to sacrifice a piece to protect the king, especially if there is no choice. It's equally possible that the Uchiha could have resisted all attempts to bring them back into the fold. Then they should have been destroyed but not until it was confirmed where the pieces on the board lie. What other moves can be made? I want you to play this international game of shogi with your head, not your heart. She sat there and thought more about it. She nodded. It was then that Shikaku claimed the clan would continue with Konoha, so long as she kept true to his words. And to prove that she would do so, she invited not only him, but Inoichi Yamanaka, Choza Akamichi, and Hiyashi Hyuga to all be a part of her council, to which their words would help her make proper choices. If the village was the king, then all pawns, including herself, needed to be together to properly communicate and devise their next moves. It's around this time that Itachi Uchiha returns to the village. Having been pardoned, and having had his cover within the Akatsuki blown, the only thing he could do was return to Konoha. Along with him comes intel on its members, as well as their goal of collecting all the tailed beasts, including the one inside of Kushina. Kushina takes this knowledge to heart. The defenses of the village are increased, and a bolo for any Akatsuki members is put out by Kushina to all shinobi in the village. A goodwill message would later be sent out to the other great shinobi nations to inform them of the threat of the terrorist group that seeks to take the tailed beasts. Itachi's return to the village is not without controversy, as Itachi was the one to carry out this order, even if he was coerced into doing so. Some see him as a heroic person who sacrificed everything for the village. Others see him as a homicidal maniac who murdered his entire family. Caught in the middle is Sasuke, who despite realizing what had happened, still remains caught in a love-hate relationship with Itachi. To aid in the rebuilding of their nation and the acknowledgement of their feelings, Kushina assigns Itachi to become the leader of Team 7 and then places Sasuke on it, alongside her son, Naruto, and Sakura Haruno. This starts out rocky, as Itachi has never been the leading type. He's been on teams before, yeah, but never as the leader. He does his best, but Sasuke remains distant. His conflicted feelings come from how much he idolized Itachi, yet he watched him kill their parents. Sasuke by this time understands why Itachi did it, but a part of him can't get over it. There are some scars that are just too sensitive to be touched. This leads to Sasuke becoming more and more distant from Itachi. Kushina even attempts to mend the bridge by allowing Sasuke to stay at Itachi's apartment, but in the night she finds him back in the Hokage's residence, trying to sleep in his own room. Some nights he just stays awake, twiddling his thumbs, or masterfully solving a puzzle cube with the photographic nature of his Sharingan. She would walk in and sit down beside him and ask what's wrong. He would shrug it off. She would ask why he's not happy to see his big brother again. He wouldn't answer her, he would just continue to solve the cube over and over again with ever-increasing speed. Realizing that it'll take a lot more than just quality time to defrost their relationship, she decides to give them the extra special mission to the Land of Waves. She hopes that by sending Sasuke there with Itachi and Naruto, that it might offer some normalcy. After all, throwing Naruto in there as a happy medium between the two should help Sasuke feel more at home, while attempting to mend his tattered relationship with Itachi. While they're on the mission, Sasuke mostly keeps to himself, and Itachi tends not to talk directly to him out of respect for his little brother's personal space. 
Still, Sasuke shows incredible strength and fortitude when facing off against the Demon Brothers, and when Zabuza attacks, Itachi's sheer strength as well as the abilities of his Mangekyo Sharingan are plenty to give him the complete edge, allowing them to complete their mission, the building of the bridge being completed soon after, named the Bridge of the Storm God. Kushina, meanwhile, is hard at work readying for the other village leaders for the upcoming Chunin exams. She was signing off on proctors and planned tests. All the while, Hiruzen was there trying to help her figure out which tests were best. As this went down though, she suddenly receives a visit from Jiraiya, who she welcomes with a hug. Together, they go about planning the exams. It's then that Jiraiya asks if she's going to let Naruto take the exam. Kushina states that it's not her place to decide whether he should or shouldn't, and that it's Itachi who gets to decide. She mentions though that when Team 7 returns from the Land of Waves, that she will recommend allowing Team 7 to take the exams. Regardless of if they're allowed to join or not, Kushina states that she wants Jiraiya to train Naruto. When the old sage asks why, she mentions that it would do Naruto some good to train under his father's mentor and learn the same techniques that Minato did, as a way for her to allow Naruto to grow closer to the father he never knew. However, she did have a secondary objective. She wants to pull Naruto away for a while and force Sasuke into training with Itachi, hoping that if she really forces it, they just might reconcile. Hiruzen would then mention Sakura, asking how Kushina plans to deal with her, as she she would then have nowhere to go if she's forcing Sasuke and Itachi into some alone time. Kushina mentions that she will take her under her wing personally, teaching her some techniques that will make any girl into a weapon to rival the greatest warriors in the Shinobi world. Team 7 would return, and Kushina would prod Itachi to see if he thinks it's feasible to allow Team 7 to take the exams. Itachi says they could, and so they're allowed to join. Kushina, like many other heads of the village, is paying attention to the test, but isn't seeing what's happening outside of it. A new game of Shogi has started, and the king is is in check. As the test continues and the second stage begins, Kushina is informed that a set of three bodies have been found. She goes to check it out and finds a group of shinobi from the hidden grass. What she finds so peculiar about this group is that they no longer possess faces. Hiruzen identifies the jutsu and informs Kushina, who would immediately send shinobi into the forest of death to find whoever are impersonating the kusanin. They don't find anything, but they do find the unconscious Sasuke laying by Naruto and Sakura. Naruto and Sakura both agree that they need to get Sasuke help and so they forfeit the match. Match. They bring Sasuke back and he's admitted to the hospital. Kushina is the first to rush in and see him. Itachi comes as soon as he can. The doctors inform them that Sasuke has been affected by a cursed mark placed on the base of his neck. Hiruzen recognizes it and calls for Anko and reveals that she also has the same pattern. The Curse Mark of Heaven Hiruzen informs her that the jutsu he has witnessed leads him to believe that Orochimaru is in the village and that he's up to no good. Hiruzen would mention that Sasuke bearing the curse mark would mean that Orochimaru is hoping to take his body. Itachi confirms that this is likely the case. He informs both Hiruzen and Kushina that Orochimaru had been within the Akatsuki for a time, but had left the organization without honor and only one of his hands after trying to take Itachi's body over the Sharingan, which now only he had. He mentions how he fought Orochimaru off and that now he may be going after Sasuke, as he is the only Uchiha left with a natural Sharingan to Itachi's knowledge. Well, besides the masked man that he believed to be Madara, or someone using that name as a guise. Hiruzen tells them that they need to be very careful, and so for a time, they put Sasuke under surveillance to protect him. Itachi eventually decides to use his little brother's visage as bait, but using the transformation jutsu to become an exact replica of him. The Chunin exams continue on without a hitch, and eventually a month comes for training. By this time, Naruto has already left with Jiraiya to do some training of his own. At the moment, Naruto is learning Rasengan and Sage Mode. Sasuke, though, has had the evil sealing jutsu placed on him and is recovering far from the sight of anyone but those trusted within Konoha. As time passes, Itachi would return to Sasuke to check up on him, but Sasuke seems as distant as ever. Itachi feels unworthy to actually interact with him, but Kushina is tired of watching this, so she basically commands Itachi to go in and talk to Sasuke. Itachi obliges and goes in to speak with his brother. For a time, they sit in silence, with Itachi breaking it with small talk only to receive the cold shoulder. Itachi would try to work through it and speak of something else, something maybe they had in common. Itachi, despite everything, is actually beginning to feel affected by this. He thought he was willing to take on any burden, any pain to keep Sasuke safe. But now that he no longer needed to play the villain anymore, Sasuke still hated him, and that stung a lot more than he could admit. In an effort to connect, he asks Sasuke for a sign, anything that proves he still loves him no matter how small but Sasuke doesn't speak, merely keeping his back turned. Itachi would wait a moment, and upon receiving no answer, he would nod and say that he probably deserves it anyway before standing up to leave. But before he leaves the room, a voice speaks. Why did you kill them? Itachi would stop and look back. What was that? 
Itachi would wait a moment before another response. Why did you kill mom and dad? Itachi closed his eyes as he thought back. It was my orders. Sasuke didn't seem to take that as an answer. But why did you decide to follow them? Itachi would come back into the room and slowly sit down. It was to protect you. Sasuke's head raised, but remained facing away from Itachi. Protect me. Itachi would continue. Donzo threatened your life, saying that we could all die together or that I could save your life by killing them myself. Sasuke would sit for a moment longer. We could have just run away, he said, with the slightest bit of emotion in his voice. Itachi shook his head. That wouldn't have been feasible. The Anbu would have found us. That was if I could even get father to leave the village with us all. Sasuke remained silent as Itachi continued. It was the only thing I could think to do. I had to save your life. If I hadn't chosen to kill the Uchiha, you would have died. I did it for you. Sasuke shook his head. I needed you, he said, his emotions boiling to the top revealing without looking that he had lost his composure, that he was crying. If you wanted to save me, then why did you abandon me? Why did you insult me, torture me, and then leave me if you loved me so much? Itachi's heart was struck by that. Sasuke, I always loved you. I left you here because I wanted you to be safe. Where I was going, what I was doing, you didn't need to be exposed to that. Sasuke snapped. I didn't need to be exposed to my parents' death. Itachi was silent. Sasuke didn't respond either. A silence fell upon the room for about 60 seconds. Itachi broke that silence. I wanted you to hate me. I wanted you to grow stronger, to find me, to make me pay for what I had done and return to Konoha as a hero. Sasuke would sniffle a little. I didn't need to be a hero. I needed my brother. I was alone and needed my brother, but you left me, called me weak, said that I wasn't worth killing. You forced me to witness the death of my parents through your genjutsu. If you had explained it to me, I would have listened. I might not have understood, but I would have trusted you. I worshipped you, Itachi. You were everything I wanted to be. I would have stuck with you. We could have left the village together and stayed together, but you abandoned me. You killed to save me and then you abandoned me. Itachi would shake his head and kneel beside Sasuke's bed. I didn't want to abandon you, Sasuke. I wanted you to be safe. Sasuke looked back at him. I don't care. I lost my parents and ended up dumped onto Kushina. If she hadn't taken me in, there's no telling where I would have ended up. I didn't care where I was. I didn't care that you were in a dangerous place. I wanted to be with you. Itachi would sit by the bed and hug Sasuke as he cried into his shoulder. Outside the door, Kushina was listening all along and was fighting tears of her own. This was the pain that Sasuke was carrying with him for so long. The pain of abandonment. Kushina was like a mother to him, but she could never replace his real mother. And Naruto would never replace Itachi. She had known that all along, too. She then collected herself and moved on to let the two brothers have their moment. She wiped tears from her eyes and smiled, knowing that this was the first step to them reconciling. As the month came to an end, the Chunin exams began again, but there was no sign of Orochimaru. Speaking with Hirazin, she would ask why Orochimaru would come back besides for Sasuke, and Hirazin would tell her that he was here to kill him and challenge the might of Konoha. Kushina, hearing this, would command Kakashi to remain with Hirazin, to which he agreed. As the semifinals began, it was down to Neji and Gara, but in the middle of the fight, Gara put himself to sleep and awakens Shukaku. Shukaku begins to devastate the arena. At that point, a smoke bomb goes off in the Kage's viewing box. Kushina would end up trying to stop Gara while Orochimaru and Hirazin fought. Kushina would enter the arena as the One Tail would begin to focus attacks on her, recognizing her as the host of Kurama. She would attempt to capture the beast with her adamantine chains, but this fails as Shukaku breaks through them. The people are scrambling to get out of the stadium as members of the Anbu rush out of the woodwork to aid her. Speaking of woodwork, guess who shows up? Yamato. Yamato is currently the only member of Konoha's military to be capable of using wood release, the same techniques that Hashirama Senju used to create each of the tailed beasts. However, his usage of it is limited, as he doesn't have the chakra reserves required to utilize the full extent of it. However, with Kushina there, they could do it. Utilizing Hokage-style 60-year-old technique entering society with bliss-bringing hands while she uses her adamantine chains. Doing these two together has the combined effect which would force Shukaku back into Gara and leave him unconscious. Elsewhere, Hiruzen is fighting Orochimaru, but after a time, the Reaper Death Seal is used. Regardless of if anyone interacts to help at this point, Hiruzen would die. However, as he spends over an hour attempting to seal Orochimaru, during that time, Kushina would show up and see Hiruzen in there attempting to do so. She would curse as she can't get through the barrier, but Kakashi would manage to get her through using his Kamui. Once she was inside, she could give Hiruzen some of her chakra, which would result in Hiruzen being capable of sealing Orochimaru away completely before he himself is as well. Kushina laments the death of Hiruzen. 
she had not only been robbed of an advisor, but of a friend. However, with the threat of Orochimaru out of the way, they must now focus on the Akatsuki. Kushina knows that this plot, while devised by Orochimaru, was likely a plot by the Akatsuki to get rid of her and steal the Ninetales, something Itachi confirms as likely being the case. So Kushina asks Jiraiya to join her council, but he says that it's not really his style, and instead recommends Tsunade. Sending for her, she would recruit Tsunade into the council. Now Konoha has captured Gara, but they can't keep him. After all, the Kazukage was murdered on his way to the exams, and for fear of a war breaking out, the San siblings are sent home to Sunagakure. From here, a three-year time skip occurs in which Konoha begins to prepare for war. And that's where I plan to stop it for now. What did you think? Did this sequel live up to everything you thought it would be? As you might tell, I'm actually hoping to add a part 3 to this video if it's popular enough to you all. So if you'd like to see the conclusion, which I might just make anyway since I hate it when a story stops right in the middle, let us know in the comments below. Did you enjoy our video? Well then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.